Hello, everybody. It's Marilyn Harris here of Hard at Work, and I'm doing this podcast series about creating an impactful legacy. I've been doing them uh, for a while now and just trying to help people know who other people are in the space of creating an impactful legacy, and it's all related to your workplace, the workplace culture. So today, my guest is Thomas Rosenberg, and I'm so glad to have you, Thomas. Welcome. Thank you, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to. Uh to share my journey with, with your listeners and, and viewers. Yeah, of course. So, um, well, so thank you for being here. And um, so I always ask the first question, which is really about how'd you get started doing what you're doing? I always think that's um, in, insightful because we never come to where we're going directly. It's always a zigzag or a lactose, somebody said to me this morning. So. Um, yeah, so just tell us, tell us how you got started doing what you're doing and go from there. Sure. So coaching is really a calling yeah. <laughs> and you don't always recognize the call initially. Mm -hmm. Looking back, it's a lot easier to connect the dots, right? Steve Jobs, I think said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. Right. And looking back, what I realized is even though I was focused ostensibly on grassroots organizing around energy efficiency, renewable energy, climate change work, or national advocacy, or management consulting, I was in each case really helping people get comfortable with change. Right. And after the, after a near fatal bicycle accident that I had about five years ago and holding sacred space for a friend as she passed from uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. I really realized that I was holding myself back by not responding to the call. Right. And that because this is a gift, not everybody's meant to be a coach, just like not everybody's meant to be an accountant or what <laughs> have you. And so for me, it was really honoring my gift and turning around and helping full time, not just on the side, right? Accidentally, right. Uh, but going full time as a coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's so, that's how I got here. Okay, so um, in your near fatal uh, bike accident, mm -hmm. was that when you kind of awoke to woke up to what you're really supposed to be doing? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what are some of the biggest issues you deal with right now with people, your clients? Well, throughout my career, it's really been getting people comfortable with a new role for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, going into a company and they're saying, oh, we're going to hold, we're going to put you you're a high potential candidate or a high potential employee and we want you to do something uh, new. you know maybe it's going to be you know this this new initiative you're going to lead it they're like but right. i'm i'm a technical person or mm -hmm. i only know this side of the business how do i do x y and z and so what they're discovering is that they're on their learning edge at the same mm -hmm. time they're trying to help their company transform Right. And holding space for them as they are growing into this new role mm -hmm. and recognizing their own gifts. Right. So it's holding space for them. So that could be improving, I mean, in a more concrete manner, it could be helping somebody understand their vision for their leadership. Right. Helping them improve their communication. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, helping them understand because my ethos is really reconnect to ourselves so we can reconnect to each other more easily. Right. And right. then that way it's like, Oh, so this is what I'm bringing. I didn't even realize that my energy, for example, when I walked into a room was causing right. this unintended consequence. Right. It's like, Oh, so how are you projecting yourself? Just becoming aware of that can have profound implications on somebody's eff effectiveness. Right. Right. Yeah, because I know, like, you know, I understand holding space, but can you explain to our audience what you mean by holding space? Sure. So, 
in, in terms of the business world, presumably, right? Yeah, not the way. Talking to the, yes, the yes. No, that's fine. So yeah. the when we are a leader, whether we are whether that's part of our title or our responsibilities or not, we actually are creating a vessel for collaboration, mm -hmm. for communication, mm -hmm. and and teamwork. And so being conscious about how you're constructing that vessel and holding that space quite literally, how you're commanding the room, that meeting. Mm -hmm. If you are the one leading the meeting, you're holding the space. Right. And that needs to be done in a conscious manner so you understand that everybody can be heard or you're being really conscious that everybody is being heard and mm -hmm. you actually put that out there with intention. Right, right. As my, um, I was talking to a, a collaborative partner of mine 20 years ago, she was just saying that it's being conscious in your kindness or conscious in your awakening or your mm -hmm. conscious in what you're portraying and like your message that you're delivering. This is kind of what you help people be conscious of their message or who they are, mm -hmm. what space they're giving and not giving. Right. Yeah. And I also help teams work together. You know, that right. might be peer, uh, peer mentoring capabilities so that they can sit, you know, maybe an executive team wants to get together and meet once a week and hold space for each other. They can, they can do that, you know, if they, or just working on team cohesion. If right. it's, you know, maybe it's the sales team or maybe it's the strategy team, whatever it happens to be inside the company and saying, okay, how do we work together more effectively? What's really going on here? And also yeah. just helping people understand how they can communicate more intentionally, take more conscious action, and really build the trust that is gonna make them and their organization that much more effective. Yeah, yeah, that's um, the trust and that type of thing is so important. Yeah, absolutely. So um, why do you think most people seem to have this challenge about maybe not communicating effectively or being more conscious in who they are, what they're not doing or doing? Wow, uh, small question. So <laughs> <laughs> the, I really feel like this is something it's symptomatic of our of where we are as a culture, mm -hmm. and conscious communication is not something that is cultivated. Right. You know, you might find people who work at it. You might find certain families that work on it. You know, and somebody's gonna say, "Well, you know, my family is an ex an exception. Yeah. That may be. Yeah. That's wonderful." And it's not something that's encouraged necessarily. So being able to really understand also why you have the perspective you do and being able to do that work and do that introspection, that takes time. And not everybody, everybody's at a different place with their own process. Right, right. Yeah, it's sort of like what take going back to what you were saying in your family. Most often we're just told what to do, not really to think about right. what we're doing and why yep. we're doing it right? exactly it's like what what gets approval what doesn't get approval what's taboo yeah and how you're supposed to engage with the world yeah and then it shows up in the workplace mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely so what you're doing is kind of coming in there and helping them dissect what's working and what's not working and helping them improve upon what's is working right it's it's for themselves as individuals mm -hmm. and also when you're talking about a team or an organization it's the culture right and you know for me i firmly believe that we need to start with the culture first mm -hmm. then you can build a structure that supports that culture and people thriving and then right. you create the strategy right. all too often people start with the strategy i have to get this widget to market Oh, I need to hire a couple of people. Yeah. And then the company grows and then you've got 50, 60, 100, 200, 5,000 people and you're like, culture? Oh, that's just how we make decisions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's no conscious thought going into that. And so in my opinion, it's kind of backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what you're doing because everybody's done it backwards is to go back and dissect it and bring it back to the beginning. Right. right. And it 
should be. And then they find out, oh, that's why that didn't work. And oh yeah, we can yes. do that. And, and that's going to hopefully create, I work with organizations that are going to be really conscious about how they're engaging with the world. And that is going to be much more heart centric. Right, right, right. Okay. So obviously the problem, do you think it's getting worse or do you think it's getting better? Hmm. Well, there are Overall, signs, there are, there are positive signs. I'll start with that. Okay. There, there are a growing number of companies mm -hmm. of all sizes that are recognizing the importance of this shift. And right. corporate culture, as we know it, has been around, depending on how you count it, 350 to 500 years. Right. So sh shifting that big boat so to speak and the water that we swim in as a society because this is embedded in our schools it's embedded in our government institutions it's there's a lot of inertia and mm -hmm. so how do we start doing that usually in a with a few bright spots and you know working in smaller companies you can influence much more of the organization as a whole mm -hmm. so with that that statement so who is it that you really like to work with then? Like the, the size of the companies or? Yeah, so, because you're just saying that small business, you have a better chance of shifting them versus a bigger company. So who are the best clients? Like what clue um, can you give me so that um, anybody's watching this would mm -hmm. know that you are the man for, for, for them? Business? So I, I'm really interested in working with organizations that, or lead, well, leaders and their organizations that are really conscientious of how the business or organization works or inter engages with the larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So if they're really thinking about how well their people are, are flourishing inside the organization, if they're happy, and they can that can spill out into the organ into their community through their families, but also how are they consciously or unconsciously making decisions with whom they work, like mm -hmm. supplier network and that sort of thing, yeah. as well as really being conscious around their social impact, so their environmental impact, and then how that builds an economic model, a revenue model for the business. Mm -hmm. So. That's, those are the organizations that I like to work with. And typically in the 50 to, a, I'll say, 1,200, so 1,200 headcount roughly. So small or mid-sized organizations. Okay. And I feel like that's my sweet spot because I, I work across multiple sectors. Mm -hmm. But my, my sweet spot, I feel like that's my sweet spot because these companies can... When, you, when you're working with a small team, the ripple effect across an organization is much more impactful. Right. If you're working with an organization of 5,000, 10,000, 80,000, and I'm working with a team of 25 or 30 people, it's, it's like a drop in the ocean. <laughs> and the, it, it'll, it would take a really, really long time to see, have that ripple through. Yeah, yeah. So that, I just, that's why I enjoy I'll say it that way. I enjoy working with the smaller, mid-sized businesses more. Right. And is there any particular sector or industry you like work with? Because you mentioned you work through all. all I, I'm. I. Yeah. For me, what's more important is the enthusiasm and the willingness to self-reflect mm -hmm. and to address elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know that to me is more important. I. You know if that were. You know, it could be um, professional services, it could be uh, health tech or ed tech or medical devices, it could be nonprofit, it could be a government agency, right? But yeah. if, if there is that interest and there's that willingness to really make that shift, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. So do you have any examples of stories of work with that you've worked with somebody that 
was a very successful um, situation for you and your client? Well, a couple are coming to mind immediately. <laughs> one was one one example is a client uh, I had uh, a few years ago, and he works at the the nexus of of sales and finance mm -hmm. for his company, and he came to me initially saying, "I need this promotion. I I I need to get." this next step yeah and it's like okay let's just take a step back and understand like, what's going on who is this person and long long story short the the shift that occurred in him was he realized he didn't have to try he didn't have to insert himself into these really intense conversations to be seen or mm -hmm. to be heard mm -hmm. and he kept feeling like he was spinning wheels and he was just trying to get airtime Right. And I said, just sit back and ask the question, because if you observe that the question, that the conversation has gone off course, right. what if you were the one who asked the question that brought it back on? Mm -hmm. And as soon as he started to do that, his relationship with a lot of the senior executives in the company changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And he started to be seen as a peer. Right. And not as a, uh, yeah, um, you know, not as, as someone who is lesser than. And so that was just mm -hmm. really fascinating. And it also shifted how he was able to manage and coalesce his, his own team, right. which was because of the situation, sort of the nexus, it was growing quite rapidly. They actually doubled in size in about mm -hmm. 18 months, his team from about six to almost 20. Mm -hmm. And so it was really impressive to see just how he, his confidence built, build, uh, uh, and the where, where he shifted because all of a sudden he was much more comfortable. He had much more space mm -hmm. and he didn't feel like he was on a hamster wheel as much. Right, yeah. So it just became more comfortable of who he was. And also in his role, you know, yeah. he was consciously making the choice like this is what I do now and then I'm going to give myself space tomorrow for strategic thinking, for example. Right, right. Which is something that we constantly forget. We get so accustomed to the hamster wheel. Oh, there's this task and this task and this task and this task and oh, I have to go home now. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And we just get yeah. stuck. And then, like, give yourself space to think. How are you expected to be a senior executive if mm -hmm. you don't think strategically? Right. If you don't give your time yourself the space. To, right. To so you have to give yourself spaciousness for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to show up for yourself first before it really can be of service to anybody else. Right. Yeah. And that's that was really the shift that we saw over six months, it was, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you like to work with clients on a longer term basis or a shorter term basis? I typically start with clients on a six month basis mm -hmm. because, so I'm trained as an integral coach, which is integral coaching is a developmental me methodology that focuses, focuses on the entire being and of the client and their social context. And, to hardwire new habits, patterns, behaviors neurologically, it takes mm -hmm. on average six months. Mm -hmm. So I like to work with a client for approximately for six months and we see where we're at. You know, mm -hmm. it may be that the client wants to continue it, or just extend for a few sessions just sort of say, okay, I need another month of support. Okay, great. Right. Yeah. Or they may say, okay, this is good. Let me come back in a few months and go up to to another step but yes i prefer to work with individuals for six months with companies it's typically a longer engagement mm -hmm. uh, as short as nine ten months and as long as 18 months to two years mm -hmm. just because it's more moving parts it takes longer yeah. to more people embed to those changes and yeah. allow that to be embodied in the organization so that they can continue their own process after we're finished mm -hmm. Because yeah. that's really important for me. 
Yeah, because you've got um, more people, right? Yep, exactly. To work with. <laughs> yes, there's more moving parts, and and it's also practicing that shift uh, mm -hmm. on the regular basis in a consistent pattern. Okay, so um, you provide coaching services. What else do you do for clients? Anything else? Well, I, I for for those who are interested, I can also facilitate say an offsite or retreat staff retreats if that's of interest as well if it's sort of the other side of the coin of coaching mm -hmm. uh, for shorter engagements but also a slightly different uh, skill set so that's but it, it's really for me my focus is primarily on the you know the leadership the culture and the effectiveness question right right, right. for individuals and teams okay so do you have a couple of tips that you can share with um, leaders about how to become more conscious? About how to become more conscious. Hmm. One of the ways is to just, for me, it's the first thing I do with clients is really just start to help them understand if they can enter a meeting mm -hmm. without the previous meeting being on their mind. Okay. Right? So can they just ground, can they find their feet? Can they feel the energy coursing through their, their lower legs and say, okay, I'm here. That was a previous meeting. I'm mm -hmm. going into this meeting. Mm -hmm. And so that they're at least starting to be aware of what they're, bringing with them each time and you just start with baby steps like that mm -hmm. that's what i would do it's just also just how many times a day are you deep breathing right how many times do you take 30 seconds to just take a few deep breaths and figure out where you're actually approaching the the situation whatever's in front of you whether it's a difficult conversation or an email or a meeting right and mm -hmm. So, like, are you doing it from your head, your heart, or your body? Mm -hmm. What is that like? Good, good. So, um, that's pretty a lot of great information, Thomas, that you shared today. I really appreciate you being on the call. Sure. And, um, I appreciate your energy about being conscious because I think so often people aren't really conscious. They're just like you're saying, just doing it. On like being on the rabbit hole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. No. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 uh, that's our culture. That's the water we swim in. So we to shift, we have to be really conscious about it. Yeah. So when we come out, that we are who we are, and we stand to who we are. So thank you for that. And um, so if you have um, any other questions, um, uh, so anyway, so for all the people that are listening. If you have any questions for Thomas, you'll have to be on his page, uh, blog post page, and you can ask him there, or you can reach out to him and ask him. All his information will be at podcast.hardatworkonline.org. And um, we look forward to hearing more from you, Thomas, at a later date, and get an update. <laughs> and uh, so we'll kind of go from there. So thank you for joining us all today um, for this call with Thomas about leadership, about conscious leadership and I thank you thank you very much John Thomas for joining me today appreciate it my pleasure Marilyn take care bye bye okay thank you I'm just gonna end the meeting because you have to go